All right, good afternoon everybody and welcome to the seventh New Zealand Marine Science Society webinar. Today we've got a huge topic to finish off the year of webinars. Today we're going to be talking about marine pollution and we've got four really terrific speakers or researchers from around New Zealand that are going to tell us a little bit about their research. So thanks for tuning in. Um, before I get going, of course, a little bit of housekeeping as per usual. Uh, you'll notice down the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A box. This is where you're going to write in your questions as each presenter is speaking. Now, each speaker will talk for about 10 minutes, followed by around three minutes of question time. So please do pop your questions into that chat box and I'll relay those to each speaker as they come up. There's also another box where you can add if you have any techni uh, technical difficulties, just write a little note in that and the Wizards at e-conferencing here at Otago will deal with those technicalities as they arise. So of course it's a webinar forum, so you'll notice that your microphones are already muted, the video is off, it's really just a sit and watch uh, sort of session. All right, so as mentioned, we've got four terrific speakers today. Our first speaker is going to be Louise Wilson, followed by Teresa Morrell, then Davina Shetty, and then we're gonna end with Henny Unwin's research. So please keep those questions coming. Before I get going, I must do a final spruik for the society. We of course rely heavily on membership to keep our society going. So please join the society if you haven't already. Super easy, head to the website, look for the membership tab and then join up. Give students in particular to apply for research grants and travel grants when travel resumes hopefully in 2021. All right, I think we're gonna get started. So our first speaker is Louise Wilson. Now Louise is a PhD student at, the Auckland, uh, at Auckland University. She's based up at the Lee Marine Lab, which has been studying the effects of motorboat noise on marine communities, and in, and in particular, how the noise produced by these motorboats could mask really important ecological cues. Now, Louise originally hails from Scotland, um, but she's decided to join us down here in New Zealand to do some really cool research, which she's gonna talk about now. So Louise, I'm gonna hand over to you. I'll stop sharing my screen, and then you can start sharing yours. Thank you. So yeah, I'm Louise, um, thanks very much to NZMSS for having me as part of this webinar series. Today I'm going to give a brief overview of the research that I've been doing as part of my PhD, which looks at assessing the abundance and distribution of small recreational boats in the Hiroki Gulf, and looking at the impact of those boats on coastal marine soundscapes. So sand pollution in the ocean comes from a range of sources, including commercial shipping, noise from oil and gas exploration and sonar, and it can have a diverse range of effects on the animals in the ocean, which range in severity depending on the proximity of the animal to the sound source. So, for example, close to the sound source, um, anthropogenic noise can cause direct injury to tissues, such as rupturing of the swim bladder. PTS and TTS are pim permanent and temporary threshold shifts, so a reduction in the frequency range over which animals are able to hear. Masking of sound cues that animals use to find habitat and communicate with conspecifics and defend themselves from predators, find prey. So anthropogenic noise can mask these signals and that masking can be either informational where the sound can be heard but it can't necessarily be disentangled from the surrounding noise or energetic when anthropogenic noise occurs in the exact same frequency as a sound cue of interest and so it can no longer be heard at all. And it can also cause changes in behaviour. So for example, an animal may restrict its home range as a result of anthropogenic noise and could, as a result, for example, miss out in key feeding areas. For my research, I'm particularly interested in masking. So most of the research which has looked at and the effects of anthropogenic noise in the ocean has focused on commercial vessels, but in shallow coastal habitats, it's small boats that are the problem. They're more variable in their behavior, their size, their hull material, engine size, engine type, and as a result, they emit sound over a wider range of frequencies and source levels. And that happens to overlap with the hearing range and vocalization range um, of many marine fish and invertebrate species. Also, contrary to commercial vessels, there's no requirement for small boats to carry AIS. AIS is an automatic information system which transmits information on vessel size, 
class, position, speed. Um, that's a requirement on commercial vessels. Um, so it's easy to monitor their distribution in abundance, but there's no such similar dis system for recreational boats. Um, recreational boats are very popular in coastal areas worldwide, and especially so in New Zealand. A survey carried out this year by Maritime NZ found that 45% um, of New Zealanders identified themselves as being involved in recreational boating. Um, that represents 1.6 million people. 36% of them reside in the Auckland region. So my research questions are, how does the distribution of recreational boats in the Rocky Gulf vary over space and time? And how does that sound from those boats alter the ambient soundscape? To answer those research questions, we installed seabed mounted hydrophones and cameras on the land adjacent to each hydrophone at five sites in the Hiroki Gulf, including two marine reserves, Goat Island and Tafernui. Um, the other three sites are popular recreational boating sites. Um, so the, the, this equipment was deployed from June 2019 to June 2020. And during that time, the hydrophones recorded for two minutes every 10 minutes, and the cameras took one photo every 10 minutes. So this is just an example of what the equipment looks like. We attached the hydrophones to mooring weights um, with surface protecting rebar, and there's a temperature logger on each of those mooring weights as well. And then those are our cameras, time-lapse cameras and waterproof housings. And so this has provided us with quite a lot of data. I've got over 250,000 hydrophone recordings. At the moment, I've manually processed a subset of them um, by plotting spectrograms and looking for the presence of boat noise. But ultimately, I'll be processing the entire data set through a detector, which will pick out the spectral signature of boats. And to process the images, um, with a colleague, I trained a convolutional neural network to automatically count the number of boats in each image. Um, so that sped up our workflow quite significantly. And this is just an example of how variable um, boat sound, small boat sound can be in terms of both time and frequency. These are five spectrograms on the x-axis is time from zero to 115 seconds. And then the y-axis is frequency from 50 to 5 kilohertz. Um, this shows how the sound changes in terms of frequency and the colour is um, intensity in decibels. So it shows that yellow is a stronger, louder sound. Um, and this, these patterns, Lloyd's mirror, would be indicative of, of boats when they're in close proximity to a hydrophone. But sound can appear in different ways as well, depending on how far away it is. Um, and this plot is just to show you that how well that sound, this is the same um, frequency band, that boat sound would overlap really well with this sound of big eyes popping. And there's snap and shrimp in there too. Um, so this is a summary of the camera data. It shows the number of images collected each site and each season. Um, the total number of images is there and in yellow the proportion of which contained one or more boats. Um, you can see that at Kawao, that's the busiest site. Um, there isn't as much seasonal variation there, but Terry Terry Matangi and Noises, um, they're definitely busier in summer. And Goat Island and Tafernui have the lowest number of images with boats, which is what we would hope to see. And this is a box plot which summarises the energy in the 50 to 1500 hertz band. Um, it shows a similar pattern that at Kawa throughout the year and um, when boats are present, the energy in this band is louder and it's more variable. We don't um, see, there are some examples of that at other sites in other seasons, but I think that urchin sound, which urchins feed and they produce a lot of sound when they're feeding, which is in the, which occurs in this frequency band as well. And I think that that's 
elevating the sound when boats are absent. So I'm going to be um, looking at this data in different ways, different frequency bands, different times to see if I can tease out similar patterns at other sites at other times in the year. And just to zoom in at what we can see, this, there's a clear difference between um, in Kawao at January when boats are present versus when boats aren't present. So this is a power spectral density plot with frequency on the x-axis and the colour is a spectral probability density, so that's the data represented as a normalised histogram. And the black lines are percentiles, so 99% of the data lies below the top black line. Um, and you can see that below 5 kilohertz, when boats are present, the soundscape is altered quite dramatically. And any variability that you would see when boats were absent is lost. Um, in the presence of boats. Thank you. Awesome, that was super interesting, Louise. Um, yeah, there's a really huge data set that you've created. Um, quick question, um, with the different locations that you had the sort of sound recorders out at, how does the substrate differ between those locations? And does that affect the way in which the sound's absorbed once it's produced by the boats and things? Yeah, so the, there was also a variety of depths as well. So the site that I showed the image for, the hydrophone, that was Tafranui, that was about 20 metres. Um, but the other sites were less than 10 metres. And they were all sandy substrates, but some at Goat Island and Tafranui and Terry had reefs around them, whereas um, Noises and Kawar were more kind of, they didn't have reef around them and they were a bit more siltier as well. Hmm. Yeah, really interesting. Um, and I think it's a really good point to note that, you know, there's so many recreational motorboats out there in New Zealand, especially. So, um. It's good to try and quantify or understand the impact that they're being on marine organisms. Um, yeah, exactly. Mm, all right. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so our next speaker we've got coming up is Teresa Morel. She is a PhD candidate at the University of Otago. Um, Teresa is uh, did a BSc at AUT before heading south to look at the impacts of plasticizers that are embedded in microplastics on the reproductive output of marine organisms, or in particular fishes. And so Teresa is going to talk to us about some of her PhD research, um, where she's using triple fins as a model organism. So Teresa, I'm going to hand over to you. You can start sharing your screen when ready. Awesome, thanks uh, for the intro, Bridey. Um, so yeah, kia ora, I'm Teresa, um, and yeah, I'm going to chat about my PhD project, which is to assess the effect of the plasticizer DEHP on the reproductive success of cryptobenthic fish. Um, so plastics are a pretty big topic right now, with a lot of public attention being drawn to the issue. Um, a modelling paper by... Oh, hold on. There we go. Um, a modelling paper by Ericsson et al. in 2014 found that um, and estimated that at least 20, uh, 20? Cool. Um, <laughs> 1 trillion pieces of plastic um, are calling Earth's oceans home. Um, so this um, graphic is from that paper and looking at those top two panels, the most abundant plastics um, in Earth's oceans are those below 5 millimetres or below uh, 4.75 even and these are microplastics. Um, so microplastics can be classed as primary or secondary microplastics. Primary microplastics are, um, were made that way, so like the stuff in cosmetics, whereas secondary microplastics are the result of larger macroplastics breaking down into smaller bits. Um, microplastics are problematic due to their ease of ingestibility. Um, their small size allows them to be ingested by a wide range of marine fauna. Um, so past literature has noted that seabirds, marine mammals, reptiles, fish, um, and even invertebrates are um, in ingesting microplastics in the wild. 
um, a paper by Mark et al from 2018 found that um, 33 out of their 34 fish species from four different locations in the Southern Pacific had ingested microplastics. Um, and looking at Auckland, which was one of those four um, locations, which you can see on the x-axis of this figure from the paper I've mentioned, um, there is quite a range of plastic ingestion in the fish they looked at. Um, and so that's highlighting that here in New Zealand, we are not immune from the issue of marine um, microplastics. Um, so microplastics when ingested can cause damage to the, ingest, um, the gastrointestinal tract. Um, and this can have um, consequences for the ability of that organism to ingest energy and nutrients from their food. Um, this figure from a study in 2016 by Peter et al. Um, shows that um, in B and C, the consumption of microplastics severely damaged the um, gastrointestinal tract of this species of fish, um, which, like I said before, can have consequences for the ability of this organism to um, properly ingest nutrients and um, energy. But also, in, in addition to this problem, microplastics are not benign. Um, they are often associated with hazardous chemicals, either with, which they have either absorbed from the environment or uh, from the manufacturing process. So um, DHP is a plasticizer which is used in the manufacture of um, lots and lots of plastics, um, primarily um, polyvinyl chloride or PVC. Um, and DHP is a known endocrine disruptor. Previous research as to the effects of direct exposure to DHP in freshwater fish, mammals, and even humans has found negative effects on reproductive um, capability. Plasticizers le readily leach from their plastic because they are not chemically bonded to the structure. Um, and currently there is no research to assess whether um, during digestion and, during, and after ingestion these plasticizers leach out and whether that the effects of that is similar to those of direct exposure to DHP. And this is the gap I am hoping to fill with my PhD research. Um, to do this, I am using cryptobenthic fish as my model organism. This is Forsterogy and Capito, um, a species of triple fin um, endemic to New Zealand. This species is one of thousands of cryptobenthic fish. Many cryptobenthic fish are less than 50 millimeters in length. Um, the maximum size of this species is 10 centimeters, so all of these fish are really, really small, but despite that size, they are really important in their ecosystem. The numerical dominance of these fish and their high larval output allows them to serve as an extremely important prey and energy source in their environment. And so because the reproductive output of these fish is what makes them so important in their environments, um, understanding how microplastics and plasticizers may impact and negatively influence that important reproductive output um, is really un, um, important to understand. And so to answer this question, I exposed 60 fish, um, 30 males and 30 females, um, to one of three treatments, my control, which were eating um, untreated food, um, my virgin polystyrene group, which were eating 2.5% weight of their food, was um, pure virgin polystyrene, and then my DHP group, which was DHP dosed polystyrene microplastics, um, which was 2.5% weight of their um, food again. Um, so for a five week period, I fed these fish a treated feed every second day to help mimic the randomness of plastic exposure in the wild. Um, and during this exposure period, any clutches that were laid were noted and at the end, um, all the fish were euthanized and dissected for their gonads, liver and white muscle for further analysis. And so to start, by um, to start talking about my results, I want to say that my fish, the condition of those fish did not change their body condition rate stayed relatively similar and some treatments the fish even gained weight. Um, this is important to note because if my fish had lost a lot of condition, then the um, findings they have lose some credibility because the fish may have just been genuinely, generally stressed um, rather than it being a result of the, um, of the plasticizer. But because my fish didn't change condition, I know that my results are the result of the DHP and not my fish being unhealthy. Um, and so the first result I found is that the clutch output halved. So 60% of my control group laid a clutch, whereas only 30% of my DEHP group did. 
Um, this, indicate, this is the first indicator of reproductive dysfunction caused by this treatment. Um, unfortunately, the polystyrene, um, the virgin polystyrene group couldn't be included in this graph, and that's because, unfortunately, a bias of same-sex pairs um, occurred in that group, and so the clutch output is invalid. Next, I looked at oxidative stress in the white muscle tissue. Um, so during normal metabolism and in response to toxins, our body deals with oxidative uh, stress in the form of reactive oxygen species. These reactive oxygen species can oxidize and break down um, tissues and proteins and cells and things like that. And so um, as part of our routine metabolism, the body has pathways involved to deal with these. And um, so the enzymes superoxide dismutase and catalase are just two examples of a pathway, or just one example of a pathway, sorry, that can, um, that is used to neutralize and prevent damage from these reactive oxygen species. Um, so by analyzing this enzyme superoxide dismutase, I found that there was increased production of this enzyme in the um, body of my males and female fish compared to the control and the polystyrene group. Um, and similar for catalase, there was increased production of this enzyme. This tells me that these fish were under oxidative stress as they were, um, there, was, there were more reactive oxygen species present. And so they have increased their defensive um, enzyme production to try and prevent tissue damage. However, looking at this last um, part piece here, um, protein carbonyls. Protein carbonyls are broken proteins. They are proteins that have been oxidized by reactive oxygen species. And so this um, shows that even though these fish were mounting an increased ox um, defense against oxidative stress by increasing their production of superoxide dismutase and catalase, they were unable to successfully prevent tissue damage. So this big, big peak in um, protein carbonyls seen in the DEHP group compared to the other two, um, shows that this, this plasticizer DEHP um, exerts a lot of oxidative stress on the body of exposed organisms. Lastly, I wanted to discuss my histology results. So this is a photo of a healthy male gonad from my control group. Um, those SZ regions are big, big pockets of um, mature sperm and the arrows are pointing to the walls of the seminiferous tubule, which is filled with um, immature gametes, which are um, in the process of being developed. Um, this is a really regular, easy to read structure, um, and this is all looking very healthy and tidy. Um, the virgin polystyrene group is a little bit different, but pretty much um, the same. Um, there's pretty big pockets of the mature sperm, those SZ um, regions, and there is some um, pretty thick seminiferous tubule walls, which are filled with mature, uh, immature sorry, gametes. But then to look at the DHP treated group, um, there is a big, big difference. So those pockets have almost all but broken down. There are regions where there are concentrations of mature sperm, those SZs, um, and there are some seminiferous tubule walls left, but the whole structure of the tissue itself is broken down and degraded. Um, and this is due to the DEHP, the DEHP causing reproductive um, dysfunction, um, likely by endocrine disrupting. Um, so to quantify this, you can see that there was a big decrease in the number of intact seminiferous tubules, so those big pockets of mature sperm, um, from, com compared to both the polystyrene group and the control group. Um, so this is showing that the DEHP is the cause of this um, gonad tissue breakdown, which can then lead on to reproductive um, capability problems. Um, so what does this mean? Um, so because coming back to why these fish are important, they are important because of their reproductive output. Their high larvae production is what allows them to serve as extremely important prey species um, for many, many types of organisms in their um, ecosystem like coral reefs or um, temperate reefs like we have here in New Zealand. And furthermore, there are thousands of these species of fish that all serve the same purpose. And so if a lot of these fish are to respond in a similar way as I've found so far, um, that decreased reproductive um, output and the production of unfit individuals because their bodies are overly um, overloaded with oxidative stress and, and stuff like protein carbonyls um, means that these fish may 
begin to fail to serve their function in their um, home ecosystems. Awesome, so thanks for listening to my talk. Um, does anyone have any questions? That was super interesting, Teresa. Thanks for telling us about your core research. Um, I've got a few questions for you actually via the chat box here. Um, you mentioned at the start of the talk that DEHP, that plasticizer, isn't actually bound into the chem uh, plastic itself. So how quickly does it leach out of the plastic when it's in the environment? Um, awesome, thanks for your question. Yeah, so colleagues um, in Australia have found that at 20 degrees Celsius, um, within, um, within 20, after 24 hours, sorry, 50% of these plasticizers will have left the plastic and they sort of stabilize after that. But that's a lot of plasticizer to leach out. Um, PVC, um, polyvinyl chloride, which is the main plastic um, used in them, which DEHP is used in, um, is up to 50. Yeah, I think up to 50% um, made of DEHP. So that's a lot of DEHP to be lost into the environment. Awesome. Um, and what do you think the mechanism is of, of this change in reproductive output or potential mechanism? Um, so that's something I am going to be looking into further as I travel through my PhD research. Um, I'm going to start looking at whether this, um, the DEHP acting as an endocrine disruptor is um, changing hormone um, expression or even potentially changing the expression of important genes for reproduction. Um, such as the gene for um, vitilogenin, which is a protein used in egg yolks. Um, if this protein is thrown out, which is extremely um, important in the reproductive process, then um, reproductive, reproductive dysfunction will start. Super cool, super interesting. Thanks for telling us about your research today. Um, feel free to stop sharing your uh, screen and I'll end it today. Thank you. Awesome, thank you so much for having me. Our guide third speaker today is Davina, and Davina Shetty is a master's student from uh, Auckland University, where she's also collaborating with the folks at NIWA. Um, Davina moved to New Zealand a few years ago from Bangalore, India, after switching, after deciding to switch disciplines, a massive segue actually, from software engineering into marine science, um, which is quite the departure. Um, so Davina is going to talk to us today about the prevalence of plastic pollution in the waters around New Zealand and whether or not this might have any impact on the fish that we're consuming or that we're buying as fish consumers here in New Zealand. All right, over to you, Davina. All right, thank you. Um, I'll just share my screen. All right, kia ora. My name is Devina and I just recently completed my master's thesis in collaboration with the Institute of Marine Science and in NIVA at Auckland. And I'm super excited and happy to be able to share a bit of my research with you today. Titled The Incidence of Microplastics in Inshore Fish Species and Surface Waters in the Haraki Gulf. So I'll start with a bit of a background. My background does overlap with Teresa's background, so please bear with me, I'll try to be quick. So what are microplastics? Microplastics are plastics that are less than five millimeter in length and they can originate from shards broken off larger pieces or microbeads from cosmetic use. Most of them are synthetic fibers that come from our clothing. And so soon scientists began noticing that these tiny pieces of plastics were polluting our oceans. And although larger pieces of plastics contribute most to the overall mass of plastics in our oceans, they account for a small, tiny amount when it comes to the amount or the volume of tiny plastic particles. So this study done in 2014 estimated that we have 5.25 uh, uh, trillion pieces of plastic. Teresa did mention 21 million, so it's increasing at a logarithmic scale every year. And so these, these tiny pieces are making our oceans into what I would call a cesspool of toxicity. Why? Because they cause an array of detrimental effects on the animal. They can affect their metabolism, physiology, with the example of DEHP. 
and um, their growth. So there was one study that showed that uh, microplastics increased the likelihood of disease in coral from 4% to 89%. They act as a magnet for toxic chemicals. So they ab absorb chemicals as well uh, as leach out chemicals into fish tissue um, affecting their physiology. A study done in 2017 here in New Zealand in Canterbury showed that they decrease energy reserves or fat reserves in our muscles. And of course, for our larger animals like our whales, our dolphins and turtles, they lead to intestinal blockages and a false sense of satiation and even in extreme cases lead to death. So why is it so important to study microplastics? Reliable, accurate marine debris data um, ongoing research on this aids in the improvement as well as adjustment of environmental legislation on a national and international level. It helps us optimize waste management practices and it helps us educate our future and civil society on sustainable practices. So if we move on to the aims of my research. So I looked at six species of fish commonly found in the Haraki Gulf and investigated the factors that influence the presence of microplastics in these fish. So the factors I looked into were habitat, if there's a significant difference in microplastic um, um, ingested by uh, pelagic fish compared to demersal fish, then proximity to urban areas. If fish caught closer to Auckland, such as Waitamata Harbour, had more or less plastics compared to fish caught offshore, like Little Barrier or Great Barrier Island, if there was trophic transfer of the plastics. So if plastics were transferred from prey to predator, for example, kahawa eat other smaller fish such as anchovies. So the plastic was transferred from anchovies to kahawa. And also we looked at um, the gills of pilchards. Pilchards are, are a pelagic filter feeding fish. And because um, they uptake microplastic to, to their grill, gills, I also looked at gills of pilchards. Um, my second chapter looked at um, assess the amount of floating plastic debris, the quantity and spatial distribution of microplastics in sea surface waters around the Gulf. In the end, I quantified the polymer type, size, number, and color of microplastics using an analytical tool known as ATR, FTR, IR spectroscopy, and Raman spectroscopy. Now, these are the geographical markers for where the fish for my study were caught at. Larger circles indicate more fish were caught from these areas or a larger sample size. These are the sampling locations for our surface water trawls. Most of my, we had, uh, we conducted 39 surface water trawls. Most of them were in the inner gulf. That was because of sampling limitations because I got my uh, samples uh, from a whale watching boat. Now, once I um, have my samples, I moved on to my next step, which is extracting these microplastics from these fish. Um, all these steps were conducted inside a laminar flow cabinet, which is a positive flow cabinet. It pushes purified air out into the atmosphere. And so it prevents contamination from external sources such as air or fibers from our clothing. And I did this to ensure that I neither underestimate nor overestimate the amount of plastics that I've found. I'll walk you through the steps. The first step is a dissection. So um, I removed the gastrointestinal tract of the fish right from the esophagus all the way to the anus. And I undergo a chemical digestion method to remove all the organic ma matter. So after a lot of trial and error, we found 10% KOH to be most effective. And we incubate these samples in the oven at 40 degrees Celsius for about two to three days. I then filter these samples to a through a glass microfiber filter paper. It was 0.7 micrometers in um, pore size. And as you can see here on the screen, if the fiber is relatively clear, then I uh, take uh, the glass, the filter paper and put it under a microscope and look for plastics. 
But as you can see on the screen here, if there's a lot of remnants, that if, if there's a lot of sediments or bones, then it's harder for me to look for plastics because the plastics might be lost in the crevices here. So I uh, conduct an additional step known as density separation. I take a calcium chloride solution, which is high density, 1.8 grams per centimeter cube. And I put my filter paper in there, sh shake it up a little uh, to the orbit orbital shaker centrifugation. And all the light plastics float on top and all the bones will sink down. I then take the filter it again, take the filter paper, look at it under the microscope. And as you can see, we found a small blue um, plastic here. Additionally, in order to um, assess the amount of floating plastic debris, we conducted surface water trawls using a plankton net with a flow meter attached. The captain dispatches the net at the stern of the boat at a speed of about two to three knots for five minutes. The flow meter helps us assess the volume of water we filter through. So we filter through about 30 to 40,000 liters of water per surface trawl. And it also gives you the surface area that we've trawled. Once we get our sample at the collection jar, as you can see, we filter it and look for microplastics under the microscope. So what did we find? Um, we found various different types of plastics ranging from filaments to films to fibers to fragments from all different species of all six species of fish. The same with our water samples. Out of 39 water samples, 37 were found to have plastics in them. Now, in order to determine that what I found is indeed plastic and not any other material such as glass or sediment or metal, I need to conduct a spectroscopy um, um, analysis known as ATR-FTIR. So it works by sending an infrared light onto the sample and then you get the uh, graph as you can see. And so different types of plastics like polystyrene or polyethylene will give you different spectra. Or if it's not plastic, it, it will give you a different spectra if it's organic matter or some other material. So it helps determine the polymer type of marine debris. This is important because it helps in management and policy decisions when it comes to the production and disposal of a plastic. So most of our plastics were found to be of the polyethylene type. And these are my results. So we found 121 pieces of plastics in 70 fish out of a total of 305 uh, specimens from six species. So the average plastic ingestion rate across all species was about 25%. So one fourth of fish that we exam examined had plastic in them. There wasn't a significant difference when it came to habitat. The mussel and uh, pelagic species had about 25% ingestion rate. Although snapper caught closer inshore had more plastics compared to snapper caught offshore. Pilchards too had a similar ingestion rate with 25% and 5% uh, of these plastics were uh, taken up by the gills. There was secondary ingestion or trophic transfer of plastics observed in snapper and kahawai. And the common um, size were fibers of less than one millimeter in length with common colors being black and blue. So, um, our flounder species had ingested the most number of plastic at 52.6% and the least plastics were ingested by Gurnard, although Gurnard had a high plastic load, which means that only three, spe three fish out of 44 Gurnard species had ingested plastics, but these three fish had a high number of plastics in them. So that's why their plastic load is higher. So this is the size, color, and type distribution of our recovered uh, microplastics. Most of our plastics were found to be uh, fibers, about 50%, followed by filaments. Again, common colors um, were blue and black, 
Um, that can also be an observational bias because our filter paper was white in color. So it's harder to look at transparent and white plastics. Um, when it came to our surface waters, the red circle that you can see, um, northwest of Rangitoto um, Island, that's where we found the most number of plastics with about 49 pieces in one sample. And the yellow spots where uh, where we didn't find any plastics at all in our samples. So the total number of plastics we found in our water uh, samples across all 39 samples were 500 exactly. And the average particles per sampling sites were 13.1 with the average concentration of 931 pieces per kilometer square. Again, fibers comprised um, around 89% of plastics in our water. Common colors were black and blue, with the average size raining, ranging from one to five centimeters. Only 4% of the plastics were found to be a uh, macroplastics that is larger than five millimeter in length. And that um, a, a big thank you. I couldn't have done this alone. I had plenty of helping hands guiding me, including Neva, Auckland Whale and Dolphin Safari, Sanford Fish Factory, and Output Boating Club in Auckland. And the biggest thank you to my supervisor, Dr. Darren Parsons. Any questions? Awesome, Davina. That was super interesting. Mm -hmm. um, thanks, thanks for telling us you about your research and your masters. Um, I definitely have a few questions because I'm pretty interested in that topic. Mm -hmm. um, with Looking at the uptake of plastic condition via the gills, how did you quantify that? Did you extract the gills and then digest them in the same way as the gastrointestinal tract? Yes, that was the exact same process. I just isolated the gills from only pilchards and it underwent the similar process of chemical digestion and vacuum filtration. Mm, cool, cool method. And you said that uh, flounder, I believe, had the highest rate of plastic ingestion compared to the other species. Yes. Um, any, any idea why that might be the case? Yes, um, I hypothesize that because flounder is one abentic species of fish, so 70% of microplastics sink to the bottom of the ocean seafloor. Um, so benthic, benthic species might be ingesting more. And secondly, all, um, all my samples of um, flounder were taken from the Waitamata Harbour, which is quite a um, heavily polluted area. So I think that's why we found so many plastics from flounder. Mm, that's cool. Yeah, it makes sense that a benthic associated fish would be exposed potentially to more plastics. Yeah. Um, but it was interesting that the gurnard which is also benthic associated didn't have the same pattern but you did mention that three was it three individuals had yes. really high plastic what kind yes. of numbers were they um i think um overall in gurnard three uh, three fish in total had about nine pieces of plastic so an average of three plastics per fish and my gurnard were caught slightly outside of the marine park so it's um not as close to Auckland as my flounder species. So maybe that could be the reason. Yeah, all right, another question. Um, how long did it take you to complete this research? It took me one, 1. 1.5 years. Yeah, so a year yeah. and a half, including um, because I fractured my leg in the middle, so I couldn't go to the lab. So that's why I got an extension. Otherwise, typically wow. this should have been completed in about a year. Mm. It's quite the process though, digesting uh, yes. guts and things yes. like that. It yes. sounds easy when you see someone explain it, but um, yes. yeah, in theory it's a bit more difficult. Mm -hmm. All right, I think we'll move to our final speaker. Thank you, Davina. Um, if you don't mind stop, uh, stopping screen share, oh. I'll introduce our fourth and final speaker for the session. Right. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, our next speaker we've got coming in is the who is a scientist at the Cawthorn Institute. Um, Henny has a background in marine biology, chemistry, and Māori. Uh, one moment, sorry. Uh, Henny's going to talk to us about a really cool program that she's helped, uh, developed with colleagues that you can put information in about plastics and track where they're going to flow in the environment. So I'm very much looking forward to hearing um, about Henny's research. Um, over to you, Henny, if you don't mind sharing your screen now, that would be terrific. Oh, you've already done it. Perfect. <laughs> 
Kia mai tātou, koe nei te mihi mai o hea ki a koutou katoa i mā takitaki mai i tēnei ahi ahi. Koe nei hoki i te mihi ki ngā kai korero i mua a hau, i whakātou mai tā rātou ranga hau. Miharo rawa te kitikitia. Ko ai tēnei huri tēnei no nga te tūwhare toa, nga te kāhununu rawa ko te atahonu a paparangi, ai he kairanga hawa hau ki Cawthorn Institute, ko hini anuan te koingua. So kia ora everyone, I'm a researcher at Cawthron Institute, um, as Bridie had said, and I just wanted to say hello to you all this afternoon, and um, it was great to see those presentations before, so thank you Marine Science Society for putting me next to some amazing speakers. Um, so I'm here today to talk to you about communicating marine pollution, um, and as you saw before in the previous speakers, marine pollution is very abundant in the environment, and uh, especially with plastics, it is, you know, international research demonstrates that plastics are pervasive in the environment and this problem has been likened to climate change due to its global scale and the magnitude of potential risk it poses to the ecosystem health and resilience, like we saw from Teresa's talk and with Davina's, no, Davina's talk, yes, with Davina's talk. And, um, you know, it poses also risks to human health and the economy and all those other things as well. Um, and so I'm here to talk to you about communicating that marine pollution out into the wider society because I believe that there is a lack of understanding on how far your plastic can travel from your own backyard and what we are doing to actually contribute to that problem. So this is about to try and pull away that mask and showcase where it can go. So um, I think the main reason behind that though is, uh, you know, when you put away your plastic or when you throw away some rubbish, it gets out of sight and out of mind. So it's really hard to picture what happens to it afterwards. And it's really hard to picture when it goes into the ocean as well, because the ocean system has currents, winds and waves, and there's not really like a map you can follow to say, oh, I'll go this way or that way, because it's always changing as well. So what we have done here at Cawthron is we have developed a tool to showcase what can happen and how far your floating plastic can go. And this project, if I change the slide now, yes, this project was uh, born from a Sustainable Seas National Science Challenge, so shout out to Sustainable Seas. Um, it was a project called Participatory Tools, and it was interactive tools for enabling participation and knowledge exchange, a project at the boundary of science and society to develop and implement tools for facilitating participation in decision making and communicating science. So it was really about communicating that connectivity because in New Zealand, we do so much research in the world. In fact, we do so much research, but uh, what we don't do well, I believe, is communicate that science and ensure that people understand what is happening out in the environment and what they're doing to affect that change as well. So this is one thing to sort of, yeah, demask that whole situation and really be involved in it and see what happens to your plastic in the ocean. So that project is finished now and we have produced our website, which is called oceanplasticsimulator.nz, where's our plastic going? And what you can do here is you can drop virtual plastic into the ocean and it will show you where it goes and where it lands. Um, this website was really a prototype, so uh, we only had really four places uh, that we looked at because we had to sort of compromise between um, how much we could do, how much data we could put into it, as well as how much a person could sit down and look at it, because um, they're not going to wait around for half an hour for it to load. So we only started with four areas, which was the Cook Strait, Tauranga, Nelson and Auckland. Um, and we did a lot of work with uh, students and with teachers out there um, to really see how we were effectively communicating and portraying what happened to your plastic. And they really influenced how we uh, presented this and what we were talking about when we, with our little information, extra information about plastics and the environment as well. And so, yes, that is now launched and it is a prototype. And what we did figure out from that is, you know, a whole lot of front end stuff of how to effectively communicate our research. But also if we wanted to do a New Zealand wide scale and actually complete the whole, how far can your plastic go and where can it go? We actually had to make it a hundred times faster. But unfortunately, uh, the project had finished at that point, but uh, fortunately, then in stepped Moana, the Moana project. Now, the Moana project, they are 
looked at understanding, well, they're looking at understanding ocean circulation, connectivity and marine heat waves to support an enduring seafood sector. So they saw our tool and thought, you know, this model could be used for other things as well. So they helped in um, trying to f determine how we can make it 100 times faster. And so we have done that now. And we now have a prototype to showcase New Zealand wide what happens to your plastic if you drop it into the ocean. So I have a little video to show you, which will work. This technology is great. Yes, it works. Um, so this is our prototype and I will mention it is a prototype. So there's a still a few issues working through. Um, this is just a sort of start off tutorial on what we're doing, but the things might change. And I'll show you the scale of where you can drop your um, plastic in New Zealand and it's that whole entire highlighted area. You can drop it anywhere you want to in there and it's quite easy. All you need to do is start clicking and so you can click as many times as you want. Um, the, uh, the green sort of one is it's loading and then the black could say is it's loaded and it will start going. Um, they drop about 10 plastics but we'll probably change it to about 30 um, wherever you want um, and yeah, it will go run for 30 days because um, we also had to sort of say we can't run it for an entire year, otherwise we'll just crash the system and people will be waiting for half an hour as they're sitting down. And what you can do as well is you can click on the plastic parts or random plastic area and it will show you statistics of what is happening. So this is rewinding it um, and you can then drop more if you want to use the same ones or you can reset it from the bottom one there and just clean it whole slate and start again. Um, and then we also have an option of doing it as a line mode as well. So it's just where you, where it will show all of the lines um, and the ex exact pathway of where it goes. Um, and so just look at the South Island now. I always get fascinated about how far it does go, especially when it comes from Stewart Island all the way up. Yes. Um, <laughs> I've forgotten how long this video is. Oh yes, you can also zoom in closer to see exactly the pathways and see exactly where it's going as well. And there's a little eddy there in Pegasus Bay that comes around. Um, but yes, you can go into more zoom into more areas as well, like into estuaries like the Tauranga Harbour. You can zoom into the Auckland area where um, Davina did her research and you can see where all of her stuff goes as well. Um, yes, and then we also have some more information just to showcase what can happen to your plastics and links to other websites of what you can then do now. So that's cool. Um, but yeah, this is our prototype for it for the moment. Um, there might be a few things changing, but we're hoping to release that quite soon. Uh, yeah, not too sure, but at some point soon. Um, and yeah, what we see this is, we see this as a real educational tool uh, to take it out into schools and really showcase what can happen to your plastic in the environment, but also actually just start the conversation. So it's not to sort of say it's the be all and end all of like, oh, this is what happens and you're done. No, it's to begin the conversation of where your plastic is going, what is happening to plastic. And then you can bring in other things like uh, the people's research on what happens when your plastic gets into fish and what happens then. And it's really just to start that conversation and then communicate what is happening with marine pollution. There's also some science stuff involved in it as well. So we can look at, um, these are the current or planned science uses that we currently have. If you have any ideas of what you want to do with it, happy to have a chat, um, just email me, be sweet as. Um, but our current planned ones, uh, we can look at the spread of invasive species or diseases between aquaculture farms. Um, even with a low probability of connection, it's still very significant, but then you can find those natural connectivity barriers and isolate infections. So that means you can sort of see and stop it before it you know, gets to the next farm and to the next farm and to the next farm. But this does require modeling of larvae behaviors. So it's like um, the plastic particles that we currently have, they're just sort of pushed around by tides, winds and currents, whereas we would have to add another layer to those particles with the larval behavior. Uh, we can also look at the impacts of salmon farms and what that requires is adding another layer of resuspending particles. 
And then we can also look at environmental DNA of invasive species um, and helping to convert measure concentrations into likely source locations. So we can determine where they've come from, but that requires tracking backwards in time. And on the side there, we have our lovely programmers who, um, who are our lovely modelers who found out how to make it 100 times faster. And that's the paper that is currently in review. Um, I think I spoke super fast, but that's all right. <laughs> um, that is actually the end of my talk for now. Um, if there's any questions, um, or I can actually go into the website now if you want a specific place for me to show where things are going, that's all cool as well. Bye. Get on my path, though. Wow, that was super, super cool. And I've got a feeling you're going to get hammered by questions. <laughs> um, man, what, a, what an awesome tool. Um, so the first question, great tool, Hedy. How can you look at what happens when nylon, et cetera, is dropped by fishing boats, e.g. lost nets? So um, <laughs> for this model in particular, it is just an educational tool. It is for the wider community. So it's just a showcase to this is most likely what is going to happen. But to look at more of those specific questions, we can go and do more intensive research into what would happen if this nylon because also nylon would have a different type of, uh, I suppose, chemical makeup um, to different types of plastics. For this one specifically, I should have mentioned, um, these are for like a larger plastic bottle. So maybe like water bottle size and they're floating within the first, um, first five meters of the ocean. So we could go into that further, but that's also, you know, going into the next layer of science research, so. Yes, and then going maybe further in science communication. Yeah, I thought it was interesting that you made the point about um, about incorporating larval behavior if you were going to apply this tool to dispersal of larvae, for example. But you could almost think about plastics, depending on what they're comprised of, having different behaviors as well in terms of where they sit in the water column, how fast they might sink, and how fast they might get transported by currents as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, huge, huge project. Um, this is a comment. What a brilliant tool. So ambitious and amazing. Um, and then this question is, when this tool is launched, will it be available to view outside of New Zealand? To view outside of New Zealand? Um, yes, it should be available to view outside of New Zealand, not a problem. I think, well, if you look at the current one now, the um, Ocean Plastic Simulator, I'm pretty sure you can see that now and we'll try to make it the same availability for outside of New Zealand as well. And, you know, the model that we have used and the programming that we have done, it's not just to say that we can just look at New Zealand alone. Um, so we have combined different maps from across New Zealand using data from Mid-Ocean and from NIWA and from uh, another data modeling company that I've completely forgotten at the moment, so sorry. Um, but, you know, we just applied their maps and overlaid our program on top of it. So it's not meant to say that we don't even have to like keep it to New Zealand, we can look at other areas as well. Yeah, broad scale applicability. Um, is, this, uh, is this publicly available? This version, the New Zealand wide version, is currently not publicly available. We're still working through some issues and just trying to make it pretty and uh, easy uh, to use and make sure that all of those things are in line first. But we hopefully have it out by early next year. Awesome. Um, which season does this simulation represent? And can this be considered representative of a typical year? Yeah, so for the public version, the simulation is just some random season, some random year, some random month. Um, but we can make it season specific. And I don't think we could do forecasting, but we can definitely do hind casting. So we have um, we have modeled how to track, track backwards in time. So uh, we can figure out where it came from as well. Awesome. Um, I really like that you had the, the slide in there of the tool being shown to children and things because I think it's super powerful that you can show them what happens when they put plastic in the ocean, how far it goes. And um, I'm saying this because I live in Dunedin at Port Chalmers and my children go to Port Chalmers School, which is right on the edge of the harbour of Muscle Bay. Yeah. Um, and yeah, what a, what a terrific way to get a message across about pollution and where that plastic actually ends up because you're right out of sight out of mind really so um yeah that's terrific thank you so much um i think we will leave it there because we've just 
just run a few minutes over schedule, so not too bad considering. Um, so Henny, if you want to stop sharing your screen, that would be terrific. Thank you. Awesome. Guys, thanks for attending. Um, I thought it was super interesting, but of course this is my research area, so I, I love hearing talks about marine pollution and plastic pollution. Um, this is our last webinar for 2020. Um, we may be back next year. We're still sort of discussing it as a council. So if you've got any thoughts about that or if you found the webinar series super interesting and useful, please do give us some feedback. We'd be very interested to hear what the science community of New Zealand has to say about it. Um, but for now, we will sign off. Um, enjoy your Christmas holidays. Enjoy New Year. Keep safe. Be environmentally conscious. And we will see you again next year. All right. Thank you, everybody.